Hello, this is Kara Tierney from Monroe Community College, and we're going to continue our discussion on heat flow in this video. Recall that we talked about how to calculate the amount of heat flow into or out of a system. We calculate it by calculating Q, that is what we call our heat flow, and it's either equal to mc delta t, that's our math, mass times specific heat times change in temperature, or it's equal to our heat capacity times the change in temperature. The way you tell which one you use is by looking at the units of your constant. Your constant is either given as specific heat or heat capacity. Specific heat typically has units as energy per mass or moles times temperature. Heat capacity is usually given in energy per unit of temperature. Notice that our specific heat has mass in it and our heat capacity does not. When you have mass in that constant unit, you need to multiply it by mass in order for those units to cancel out. So let's take a look at how we can use this equation in further applications. So recall that the law of conservation of energy states that no energy may be created or lost in a non-nuclear process. This means that if you have energy within a system, if you are losing energy out of that system, the surroundings are absorbing that energy, and no energy is created or lost. So all of your energy is either going from your system to the surroundings, or it could be going from the surroundings to the system. Any energy that's given off by one is going to be absorbed by the other. So we can rearrange our equation as the Q of our system is equal to the negative Q of our surroundings. The values are going to be equal, they're just going to have opposite signs. So if we had a system where we took a metal, a hot metal, and we add it to cold water, uh, what happens is the energy is going to exit from the metal into the water. And if we write an equation to represent this, it is that the Q of the metal plus the Q of the water is equal to zero. All energy exiting the metal is going to be going into the water. And no energy is going to be coming from anywhere else and no energy is going to be lost to anything. So all of our energy is in balance. When we rearrange this equation, we get that the Q of the metal is equal to the negative Q of the water. You could write it the other way, where the Q of the water is equal to the negative Q of the metal. It doesn't matter. It'll come out the same, because all you need to know is that the values are the same, but they're just opposite, because all of the energy is exiting one thing and into the other. So if we were to substitute our equations that we uh, saw in the last slide into this equation, we would substitute, if we were given specific heat, the M of the metal times the specific heat of the metal times the delta T of the metal is equal to negative that of the water. So MC delta T of the water. Here we need to keep track of our masses, our specific heats and our delta T's because they are going to be different for the metal and for the water. So that's why I have the metal and water there. So let's apply this in an actual problem. So here we have problem example five. Suppose we add a 25.5 gram slug of lead at 104.46 degrees Celsius to 100.0 milliliters of distilled water at 22.50 degrees Celsius. The water temperature rises to 23.17 degrees Celsius and the specific heat of water is 4.18 joules per degree Celsius gram or gram degrees Celsius. What is the specific heat of the lead slug? So now we are asked what the specific heat is. Assume that the specific heat of the calorimeter is negligible and that no heat is lost to the surroundings. So the last sentence that we have is telling us something very key. Uh, since the specific heat of the calorimeter is negligible, we can count that as meaning that the calorimeter is not taking in is not absorbing any of the energy and no heat is lost to the surroundings. So when we write our equation, we're going to have to think of everything in our system and outside our system that could possibly be giving off energy or absorbing energy. In this case, we know that our slug of lead is going to be giving off energy to the water because we see that the 
that the lead is very hot and it's going to be uh, increasing the temperature of the water. So we have energy exiting the lead and it's going into the water. Nothing else is going to be uh, changing temperature or absorbing or giving away energy. So those are the two Q terms in our problem. Here what I've done is a lot of times students get very dragged into the fact that we have a whole paragraph here and it confuses a lot of students. So what I've done is I've just rewritten all of the numbers in very brief as to what things are. So our lead is 26.5 grams and our in initial temperature, so that's our Ti of the lead is 104.46 degrees Celsius. And our water, here's everything we know about it. So what we need to solve for is our specific heat of the lead slug. Now like I talked about before, when we're trying to figure out our equation, we determine what is in our system that could either be absorbing energy or giving off energy. Each of those things needs its own Q term, its own heat flow. So we have the heat flow in the water plus the heat flow of the lead is equal to zero. And so uh, you can now set that if you want to. Our book often will set this problem up as one is equal to the negative of the other. I tend to just leave it in this form. Either one is okay. So now let's solve this problem. So the first thing we need to do is recall that Q is equal to either MC delta T or C delta T. And we're going to substitute in one or the other for each of our terms. We are asked for the specific heat of our lead, so we know that we are going to use the second one. Our hint for that is that our mass of the lead is given, so that's very helpful. Also with the water, we see that if we go back, specific heat of water has that grams in it, so we know we're going to use it for our water as well. So when we substitute in, we substitute in for the water, so our MC delta T of water, make sure to signify that each of those are for water, plus that of our lead, so our MC delta T of our lead, all add up to zero. Now keep in mind here that our delta T's are equal to our final minus our initial. So we're going to keep that in mind, our delta, whoops, T, there we go. So now we're going to plug in our values, the 100 grams of water. Now where did that come from? That's an excellent question. We were told that we had 100.0 milliliters of water. Keep in mind that the typical density of water is 1.0 grams per milliliter. In this class, if you're given a volume of water, especially for these problems, just assume that our density is 1.0 grams per milliliter. It's actually, we can just assume it's exactly one gram per milliliter. So you can just convert this right into grams for any of these problems. We're going to multiply that by our specific heat, the 4.18 joules per gram Celsius. And we're going to multiply that by the delta T of water, which we see that the water started at 22.50 degrees Celsius and it rose to 23.17 degrees Celsius. So it's our final minus or initial. Now we're going to fill in the terms for our lead. We know that it's 26.5 grams and we are solving for its specific heat. So I'm going to put in the uh, variable for specific heat there. Now we can plug in our delta T. Our lead started at 104.46 degrees Celsius and it ended at 23.17 degrees Celsius. Now notice we have two terms here for our delta T's. In order for this to occur so that one is giving off energy and one is absorbing energy, one delta T is going to be negative and the other one's going to be positive. So that's why this one's going to end up to be negative and that's good. That means it's the one that is losing energy and so our uh, other Q term, the uh, Q of the water, that is going to be increasing in temperature because it's absorbing the energy given off by lead. And that all adds up to zero. So now what we do is we simply solve for our lead specific heat. 
The first thing I'm going to do so that I keep my sig figs in check is I'm going to do this subtraction right here. So 23.17 degrees Celsius minus 22.50 degrees Celsius. They each go to the hundredths, so our answer is going to go the hundredths. That is 0.67 degrees Celsius. So we end up with two sig figs. Our other delta T, the 23.17 degrees Celsius minus 104.46 degrees Celsius, that ends up being negative 81.29 degrees Celsius. So that helps us figure out our sig figs a little bit. So now what we want to do is we're going to multiply these terms and multiply these two terms. So when we do that, we end up with Keeping in mind our sig figs, we get 2.8 times 10 to the second joules, because we're only allowed two sig figs, plus negative 2.15 times 10 to the third. Now let's look at these units. We have grams times degrees Celsius, so that's what the unit is. Grams times degrees Celsius times our CPV and that is equal to zero. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to put this over on the other side of the equation. So we have negative 2.15 times 10 to the third grams degrees Celsius times our C of PB. That is equal to negative, because we have to subtract, 2.8 times 10 to the second joules. So now we divide. Our C of PB is equal to negative 2.8 times 10 to the second joules divided by negative 2.15 times 10 to the third grams degrees woo, Celsius. Okay, let me fix that up. That looks better. The two Negatives will cancel out to give us a positive number, and we're allowed two significant figures, so we get 0.13. Now look at these units. Joules divided by grams degrees Celsius. They work out to be the normal units for specific heat, and that is our answer. So now in our next video, we're going to do a problem very similar to this one, except for we're going to incorporate what happens when there's a reaction occurring in the vessel that we are investigating.